You see Miss Alicia over here to the side. Y'all join her for Children's Church. Adults, turn, if, if you would, to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119. Now, Psalm 119 is a large psalm with many, many verses. And uh, we're going to spend time all summer long in this psalm because it has great significance for us and because it can remind us of why the Bible is so meaningful. Why is the Bible so helpful? Why is the Bible something that continues to help us? Why is it that of all the books that are being produced every year, that the Bible is the one book that continues to be produced in larger quantities than any other book on the planet, in more languages than any other book on the planet. Why is that? Is it because there are a lot of churches in the world? No, it's because God gave us things we need to know, and that's called the Holy Bible. And the Holy Bible is something that's of great significance to us. I can read my favorite interesting book. And it will intrigue me and maybe take my mind off my problems for a little while. But you know what won't happen? It will not lead me to become a better person in the same way that the Bible will. It won't give me inspiration and a flood of encouragement. That that work of fiction won't do that for me like the Bible will. And on my worst day, you know what I need? I need to hear from God. And I can hear from God most clearly in His Word. And Psalm 119 is a really interesting psalm. You may have noticed that uh, in your Bible, when you read Psalm 119, that in verse 1, there's this strange word that says Aleph. And then in verse 9, there's this strange word that says Beth. That's not anybody's name, by the way. Um, Then it's verse 17, it's Gimel. Verse 25 is Daleth. That's where we're going to be today, by the way. Verse 25. Verse 33 is Hey, and that's not Hey. <laughs> anyway, there's Vav, or U- W-A-W. That's kind of weird, hard to pronounce. Verse 49, Zion, and so on, and so on, and so on. Listen, the Hebrew language has 22 letters in its alphabet. 22 letters. We have 26 letters in the English alphabet, right? They have 22. And what's beautiful about this psalm, it was composed on purpose... As an acrostic. So verses 1 through 8. There's always 8 verses in each section. 8 verses all beginning with the letter Aleph. Verses 1 through 8. Verses 9 through 16. Every one of those begins with that Hebrew letter Beth. Right? And, and Gimel. And today is Daleth. In verse 25 through 32. 8 verses. All of them beginning. You might say beginning with the letter D. Sort of. For us. Not really. But sort of. You understand. Listen, Psalm 119 is the Christian's golden ABCs. The Christian's golden ABCs. It teaches us about the praise of the Word of God. Because everything, in all 176 verses, everything is about the Word of God. The praise of the Word of God. The love of the Word of God. The power of the Word of God. And the use, the helpfulness of the Word of God. In fact, you may or may not know this, but there are at least ten words, ten words, where God's word or God's, what God's communicating or something that God is telling us, there are at least ten terms. So you're going to see, you're going to see words like direction, you're going to see words like instruction, you're going to see your word, you're going to see statutes, you're going to see precepts, right? You're going to see law, teach me your law. You're going to see your testimonies. You're going to see your commandments. And there's only eight. They are listed in these eight verses. But there's at least ten different words that's used in this entire psalm. What's really beautiful about that is that the command of God, written on two tablets of stone, when Moses brought it down from the mountain, written by the finger of God himself, were the ten commandments. But that word commandments could be also the word word. The ten words from God. The Big Ten, so to speak. And this poet, I mean, maybe David, maybe not, we don't really know. But this poet took ten different words and used those as synonyms in ten ways to talk about the ten things that God... But not just the Ten Commandments, friends. All of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through um, uh, Deuteronomy, all five of those 
contained things God said, and they were things and rules, not just rules though, they were also instructions and, and explanations and things God said. Those things guided an entire country called Israel, the people of God, the 12 tribes. If they read them and actually did them, they would find blessing and help. If they ignored it and didn't care, they would go their own way and find trouble. And this poet reminds us why there's such value in God's word. And he uses it with ten different words, which is, of course, uh, a poetic way of thinking and reminding us about the ten commandments and the ten words, and also about all of the Torah. And this person, this poet, saw such beauty in God's word, and you can see it too if you'll work with me. Now, Hebrew poetry does not do something where the word rhymes at the end of the phrase. Uh, Hebrew poetry does repetition, and usually in pairs, sometimes in threes. So there's a parallelism there. So you'll see in verse 25, you'll see there that there's, my soul will do this, and I need you to help me with your word. And verse 26, there's a repetition. I'm telling you about my ways, and there's some things going on with me, and then God, you, you teach me your statutes. So there's the us, and there's the God, and there's us, and there's God, and us and God, and us and God, in a relationship, back and forth, repeat after repeat after repeat, so that our heart is reminded, so that our souls are refreshed, and so that our minds are focused again on what really matters. Before we read these words together, let me just tell you a story. The story is not, didn't really happen, but the story is true enough that you know somebody kind of like these two people in this story. Let me tell you the story about the son of a grocery store owner, Eddie Jr. See, Eddie Sr. had come along and created a grocery store, small grocery store in a small town. And in that grocery store, they served the people of that town, always having what they needed. Eddie Jr., his son, grows up working in the grocery store, grows up getting to know the people of the town, grows up working hard. There's another person in this story, not just steady Eddie, Eddie Jr. Also, there's his cousin, he was hired for a period of time to come in and help at the grocery store. His name is Fake Jake. Fake Jake was the cousin, the hired hand who came on. Not a good guy in this story. Steady Eddie had grown up serving, not just his dad, but serving people and doing it by working hard and reminding himself of the placard they kept on the wall. When you come into the grocery store, there's the checkout counters, but if you look to the left, you would see the door that goes into the customer service desk. That's where the manager's station would be also. And over there, above that door, on the wall, the placard had ten words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And those ten words included words like integrity, number one. Compassion, number two. Order. Number three, cleanliness. Number four, and so on. Lots of words, ten words. And if we lived in this grocery store, if we worked this grocery store, if we served our customers with these ten words, then God's going to bless our success and help us to be good in our task. And Steady Eddie grew up with the ten words right there as a reminder every day he came to work, why they were there and what they should do. Eddie Sr. passed away, and the store came into the ownership of Steady Eddie, Eddie Jr. And Eddie remained steady at serving, at working hard, at running this grocery store with integrity and with all of those ten words, with compassion, with order, with cleanliness, and with other things. He did all of that, always looking regularly at the ten words, and he was steady until his wife of several decades died. And steady Eddie, Eddie Jr., had a very difficult moment of intense emotion. His world was turned upside down. His schedule was made strange. He didn't know what to do with himself, and he would pour himself into his work, but his heart wasn't in it anymore. He'd lost the love of his life, and he was having a very difficult thing. And at this point, cousin fake Jake who had been an influence on him, but not enough of an influence on him to turn away and do evil. But fake Jake suddenly had words that made more sense to his broken heart. 
So Steady Eddie was influenced by Fake Jake in the easy way. Let's just go and get drunk and everything will be fine. Let's just go and we can find you a new woman. Let's just go and we can do... And look, it, it's not really cheating if you just do this. It's taxes and the IRS. Just take the easy way. Get a little bit more profit. Look, it, you don't have to do everything just perfect. Just do things good enough and everything's going to be fine. And fake Jake's words finally had a little bit of an influence on Steady Eddie. Until one day, Steady Eddie looked and saw the placard on the wall in the grocery store above the customer service desk one more time, and it's like a lightning bolt hit him. And he remembered years of steady, faithful work of his dad. Years of steady, faithful work from himself. And suddenly, fake Jake's way of doing stuff didn't make sense to him anymore. And that way, yes, was easier. And that way, yes... Felt better. And that way, yes, made some things soothe his broken heart, but none of it brought him the purpose he needed and the life that he wanted. None of that brought it to him through fake Jake's ways. He didn't have the heart to fire fake Jake, but he did that day go back to the ten words. And he reminded himself again, we're going to be, I'm going to be, a person of integrity, a person of compassion, a person of order, a person of cleanliness. And that's the way we're going to run this grocery store in this town. And I'm grateful that Eddie Jr., Steady Eddie, came back to being steady after a very difficult day. And he was tempted, he was tempted to go another way, but it was the ten words that brought him back. With that in mind, let's read Psalm 119, verse 25. I'm going to do something unusual and ask you to please stand. Please stand. We're going to read Psalm 119. We're going to read eight verses, verse 25 to verse 32. We have them on the screen for you if you wish. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. Here's what God says through the mouth of this poet. My soul clings to the dust... Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. And I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. These verses speak of intense pain and many, many problems. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever had that? Have you ever had your, te- your, your feet taken out from out from underneath you? Have you ever had your heart broken? Have you ever had intense confusion and shock, not even knowing what to do? You get off the phone, you've heard the news, and you don't even know what to think. You don't even know how to respond. You don't even know what's going on. God's Word is not a brick wall that we beat our head against in order to keep some rules and regulations, in order to try to please God and try to get into heaven, and we do that with frustration and pain. That is not what God's Word is. God's Word is a rock that's under us that keeps our feet steady when the wind blows at us. That's what God's Word is. I want you to notice the ways in verses 25 to 32, ways. Look at the word way. Verse 26, I told you of my ways and you answered me. 
That's a, a matter of prayer. I told you what was going on. I told you what I was doing. I told you where I was going. And you answered my prayers. Look again at verse 27. Maybe understand the way of your precepts. Look again at verse 29 and 30. False ways. Put those far from me. Way over there, away from me. False ways. And graciously teach me your law. Because I have chosen what? The way of faithfulness. The way of faithfulness. Now in the middle of this also you see verse 32. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. I will run in the way of your commandments. Listen, God can set your feet on a path. A way, a journey. You can walk with the Lord hand in hand on whatever he's got for your life. What you'll find there, if you stay on the path, if you follow the way, what you'll find there is you'll find the hope that you need, the steadiness that you need, the solid, uh, the solid path underneath your feet. You will discover that you can keep taking one step and putting it one step in front of the other. You can go one more day. You can go a little bit further. He's with you, and at least you know where you're going. A lot of people would prefer to jump off the path and run in the middle of the wilderness. They're just going to run wherever they want. Whatever I feel, whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want, I'm just going to go my own way. I'm just going to do, I'm, I'm going to follow my heart. You hear that one? We hear it a lot, don't we? I'm going to follow my heart. I want to do it my way. I just feel like I should do this, that, or the other. But what if there was a truth that was true even if you didn't believe it? Maybe there's something that's true and real about this world that maybe God has shown us. And if God has shown us what's real, what's real and true, don't you want that to be the guardrail that keeps you from going over the edge into the canyon, into destruction? Wouldn't you like to know there's a guardrail on either side of the path? Now, some people would really feel restricted by the guardrail. Now, wait a minute, what are you talking about the guardrail? I don't want to go that way. That other way looks more fun. That other way looks more interesting. That other way is kind of what I want. So I'm just going to go that way instead. If you will stay on God's path for you, specifically how God explains to us in the Bible we are to live, what you'll discover is that what you need is there. And it's there on the good days for you, and it's there on the bad days for you. Look again, and let's go through these, thinking about these two ways. God's way versus other ways. Let's think about these ways again in verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. You know how you have to get dust on your soul? You have to be laying down, face down in the dirt. Have you ever fallen? Have you ever had such trouble? Has you ever, have you ever been in that spot where you were really the cause of your own problems, and you kind of woke up in a bit of a mud Filled mess and kind of if you were honest about it a mess of your own making but my soul clinging to the dust means my soul is laid down flat my soul is dusty dirty I am in trouble and I don't know what to do well if your soul feels that way you know what you need verse 25 you need life you need energy you need encouragement you need to breathe again, and you need a direction for your life. Give me life according to your word. What has God said? He's given us lots of things that he said. He said that he loves us. He said that he's never left us. He said that he walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. He has said that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He has shown in the Old Testament that it don't matter how many times the uh, nation of Israel would mess up, he would never let go of his covenant promise with them. He would always stick there with them. And if your soul is troubled, you can find life, but you can find it from God, and you can find it in the Word. I have been in this moment where my heart was crying out, tears were streaming down my face. What's beautiful is the Holy Spirit gave me a Bible verse. A Bible verse. It was a Bible verse that encouraged me at just the moment when I needed it. And because God's word is living and active, then the Holy Spirit can use the words of God to bring life to us again. 
in a really difficult day. Verse 26. Do you believe that your prayers are answered by the Lord? This poet says, when I told you of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. I'm grateful to God for a a God that answers prayers, aren't you? But I'm also grateful that the Lord will sometimes answer my prayer. Hey, Lord, what about this? Nope. Don't ask for that. Boy, you don't even know what you're asking for. You don't understand the implications of what you just asked for. I know your heart really wants it. And I care about your heart. But no. Every good parent knows how to do that to a child who's asking for something that's not actually the best for them. And our Heavenly Father sometimes tells us no. And we ought to look up and say, you answered my prayer with a no. Thank you. It's difficult, <laughs> it's difficult to say thank you to a no prayer. But when we pray, he hears. And when he we hears, he answers. Now, some, it's either yes or it's no or it's wait. Those answers, some of those answers are easier to accept than others. But he always answers our prayers. I told you of my ways. I explained my situation. Are you listening? Yes, he's listening. And he answers. And... He's there to remind us again of the truth in the Word. And the Word, again, will guide us to what we need to know and to how we need to pray. Sometimes we're praying wrongly, and the Bible will remind us how we're praying wrongly. Oh, okay, I understand now. Oh, I see now. I'm being selfish, Lord. You have a plan, Lord, and you're with me. It's going to be okay. You're answering my prayer. Guide me with your statutes, too, though. Verse 27. Verse 27, make me to understand the way of your precepts and I'll meditate on your wondrous works. Listen, friends, I have, I'm 44 years old. I've been reading the Bible since I was a kid. You know what I've discovered? I always find something new in the study of the Bible. And what's really beautiful about the Bible is I know saints who've been walking with the Lord longer than I've been alive. Walking with the Lord for decades. They say the same thing. Something new in the Bible over and over again. Something they needed, right, when they needed it. Or some new piece of how God works. Some new understanding. And this poet says, listen, will you please make me understand? Will you please help me figure out the way? Who are you? How do you operate? What are you doing here? What's the principle behind this? What's the precept there? What is happening around me? We don't always get the answer that we need. We don't always fully understand, but I can promise you this, God will explain everything that needs explaining to you. Sometimes, he's already told you, and you say, will you help me to understand? And he brings you back to a Bible verse, and like Job, you get an answer that says, I'm God, you need to trust me, and you let go of your question. Sometimes, that's the way God guides. Sometimes, the light bulb turns on. Ding! Oh, okay. Okay. And God will explain something. Either way, Lord, make me understand. And if I don't understand, help me to still have faith. But look what it says. I will meditate on your wondrous works. What is God doing? Something wonderful. Something you couldn't imagine in your best, most imaginative, most creative day. You couldn't, you, you couldn't imagine the chess game God is playing in your life. How could he possibly work all things together for good on this day when I am crying my eyes out? Well, you can't understand what he's doing sometimes. But he is, I promise you, he is doing something amazing, something wonderful. And I think eventually, if you keep paying attention, some point you're going to look back and say, man, God sure did do some amazing, wow, wonderful, wondrous things. I need to remember that. Think about it. Keep it in my memory. Remind myself day after day about what God has done, the wondrous works. Verse 28, my soul melts away for sorrow. Have you ever felt that feeling when your knees buckle and your legs collapse and you just can't even stand? You ever had that feeling where it feels like your heart is made of water and it's just melting? We... I think all of us probably have understood that feeling when our soul melts because of sorrow. Friends, on your worst day, you know what's a really tempting principle? 
it is very, very tempting to let the intensity of our emotion lead us to a place where we jettison God. I'm so mad right now. I don't care what you think. I'm so angry with you, God. I don't want to listen to what you're telling me right now. I'm so in that, or or even not just with the fire of frustration and anger, also with the, the, the slow blah of depression. I don't I don't know if I can care. I don't know if I can make myself give a rip. I don't why? What's the point? Moments like that, it is very tempting to let go of everything that you used to believe, maybe walk away. It is very tempting to jump into sin because you feel like you're justified. You feel like it's the fun that you could find, the soothing that you could find, and the sinful activity. That would just make me feel a little bit better, so it's fine if I do that, and I just need to do that to soothe everything and make my problems go away and to make me to feel what I need to feel But what does the poet say? My soul melts, so God strengthen me. Friends, this is a moment not for you to push God away. This is a moment for you to pull God close. This is a moment for you to hang on. And sometimes you're hanging on by the edge of that fingernail. And you're almost done. And you're almost not even sure you can hang on anymore. Hang on and ask God for some strength. Lord, will you give me a Bible verse? Will you give me an encouragement? Will you whisper again the truth? Will you help me? Uh, Not that verse. Maybe another verse. Give me another verse. That one felt like an Old Testament angry verse. Give me a happy verse. (laughs) Give me something what I need. I'm struggling here. God does this so many times, friends. Through his word, he can give you strength. That's why he gave us the Bible. He gave us the Bible because it's still true, and over and over again we have what we need. Look at what else he says in verse 29 and 30. There's the false way of fake Jake, and there's the right way, the way of faithfulness it's called, in steady Eddie. God put false ways far from me, and graciously, in other words, with a whole lot of grace. I know I'm a mess, help me. (laughs) He knows you're a mess. He will help you with grace. Graciously, teach me your law. I've chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. Lord, I'm not going to wander off the path. I'm not going to jump the guardrail and go off into the wilderness and the crazy. I'm going to stay steady. This is the path you have for me. I may not be happy about it right now, but I can at least find a little bit of joy and a little bit of remembrance and a little bit of purpose and a little bit of perseverance i can hang on to that and i can at least take one more step down your journey and stay in your guardrails this is the kind of thing that keeps people married when they want to give up on their marriage god's word this is the kind of thing that keeps people sexually pure when they're tempted to go off and be be led let themselves be led astray god's word God's word is the kind of thing that can keep you from all kinds of sinful activities that we're all tempted to do. And in those moments, our flesh is crying out for something that pulls us away from the Lord, but it's God's word that comes back to us again. It's God's truth that keeps us steady again, and we say no to that, and we choose the way of faithfulness. The way of faithfulness. Why is, why is it faithful and reliable? God's way is faithful and reliable for two reasons. Number one, if you follow God's way, you're a reliable person. You're a trustworthy individual. People know what, they're get, what they get when they're getting you. They know you, you're going to do the right thing. You're kind of the person who doesn't cheat, doesn't lie, doesn't do. You, they know who you are because they know you care about God and you care about going God's way. That makes you a faithful person. It's the way of faithfulness because you can be a person of integrity, not a double-minded, two different kinds of people, fake people. You can be one kind of person going and, and, and a little bit like Jesus in the way you do. You can be that and be a faithful person if you go that way. And... That's the path laid out by a God who always is faithful himself. He ain't never given up on you, and he's trustworthy and reliable. And there's, he's the one thing you can count on when you can't count on nothing else, not even yourself. 
It's the way of faithfulness because it came from a faithful God. And it's a way of faithfulness that can make you become a faithful person. Jesus was faithful. We can be too if we go his way. I've chosen the way of faithfulness and I set your rules before me. It's not easy. It is challenging and it takes God's help. Friends, I hope every day you pray, Lord, will you please help me today? The Holy Spirit inside of you is the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So you have power in you because of the Lord. And a Bible verse every day, a Bible passage every day. These are the kind of things that you need because you're hungry and you need a little bit of manna in the wilderness every day. So feed me a little bit, Lord, with some of your word. Your word is like a bread bread of life. Jesus is, in fact, the word of God. and In the beginning was the word, John chapter 1 says. So I just need a little more of you today. I woke up today and I flipped straight to my phone and I went straight to my social media and I tried to entertain myself a little bit and Lord, I didn't find what I needed that day. Lord, help me in the morning to start my day with you, long or short, to start my day with you that I can stay in the guardrails of being the person that I know God wants me to be and what will you find? Verse 31 and 32 is what you'll find. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. Friends, we live in a world that wants to shame Christians. Okay? We're crazy for believing an old dusty book. We're foolish. Because we could be doing anything, any number of things on Sunday morning. You know how much fun there is to do on Sunday morning? Why do you go to that boring old church? Listen to that really weird preacher. Sing those songs. Those are ancient, dusty songs. Why do you even care about it? Why are you doing all that? Half those people are hypocrites anyway. Why are you even going? Why are you even doing? People try to put shame on the Christian for doing things that God told us to do. But you know what? Everybody meets Jesus one day. Everybody. Whether you love him or hate him, or whether you try to say he's not real. doesn't matter. Everybody meets Jesus one day. And on that day, I could either be ashamed or I could be happy. And if I have given my life to the Lord, I mean, I may have messed up and had a couple of sins, yes, but if I have given my life to the Lord, when I get to that day, I'm not hanging my head in shame because Jesus' blood erased my sin. So now I'm not ashamed. Now I'm happy. But the person who has rebelled against God, the person who has left God behind, the person who doesn't care about God, the person who has no relationship with God. That person, when they meet God face to face, stands in shame. Because now the truth comes out. And everything they ever did or thought is revealed. And all the stuff they were hiding from other people, all the stuff they were hiding from themselves, all of that is shown publicly and everybody gets to look and turn their head. I really did not know that's who that guy was. I'm really surprised at the attitude she had. And there's a sense of shame that comes. Praise be to God. If I give my life to the Lord, and He helps me walk on a path, in the end, I, I, don't, I don't find shame. I find joy and happiness and something wonderful at the end. So I'm going to cling to your testimonies, Lord. I want to get to the funeral, Lord, and I don't want the preacher to have to lie about me. <laughs> I want him to tell the truth about who I really was. I'm going to cling to your testimonies, and I'm not going to be ashamed of you, God. I can't be ashamed of you. You've done everything for me. You saved my life, Lord. I'm not ashamed of you. You're my best friend. Are you kidding me? You're, you're, you're what I live for, Lord. I'm not ashamed of you. They want to make me try to feel ashamed. They can't possibly make me feel ashamed. They will be ashamed of themselves one day. I don't have to be ashamed of anything. I'm not ashamed of you. will never be put to shame. I'm going to hang on to you, Lord. Verse 32, and I'm going to run. I'm going to run. We have a fence in our backyard. You know, the dog can't run over the whole neighborhood. That's really a bad idea. It's actually against the rules of our neighborhood. Can't let the dog run around without a leash. 
Get them, let the dog just run. And I got one dog, <laughs> y'all. We call her Sugar, and I'm pretty sure that she eats sugar every day. I don't know who's feeding her the sugar because I'm only feeding her dog food. But this dog is 90 mile an hour. But we have a fence in our backyard. So our dog, when we let her out, you see NASCAR? That's pretty much sugar, my dog. And if you stir her up, she is going and she is going to run. God didn't put rules and regulations in your life to make you miserable and sad about where you couldn't go. God gave you rules and regulations through the law of his word so you could run, but not run out in the street and get hit, and not run out in the neighborhood and get lost and not be able to find your way back home. Run, smile. Be happy. Have such joy in life. Listen, God's plan for you is a wonderful plan for you. And you need to run and love it. Let God enlarge your heart. Let God throw the shackles off. That that, that word, enlarge your heart, is kind of a strange phrase in Hebrew. But it just kind of means, take the leash off and let me go. But the fence is there. The rules, the, the commandments, the precepts, your word, God, that is there to keep me from running into my own trouble through my own sin. So I'm going to run in the way of your commandments. You're going to enlarge my heart. You're going to take the leash off. You're going to remove the restrictions from me. You're going to make my heart bigger, not smaller. You're not going to confine my heart and put it in a box and make it small. You're going to release it, Lord, and my heart's going to soar in you. That's what God gives when we follow his path.